Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're watching. This is Mike Krupa, your friendly neighborhood host of the Votum TV Heretics podcast, straight from Poland, coming to you from Lower Silesia. And today we have a very powerhouse list of guests who will be joining us to talk about the so-called Prigozhin thing. And as you've noticed, I have aptly titled our discussion today, Putin locuta causa finita. You know, back in the day when Europe was still fairly Christian, a lot of people would go around and say Roma locuta causa finita, which would mean that the Pope has spoken, the matter is ended. Well, if we look at what happened on Saturday, one can say that at the end of the day, it was the words of Putin who ended a lot of this, to the surprise and to the shock of many. But before we do a deep dive on this, guys, make sure to give us a sub make sure to smash that like button if you think our work is worthwhile please give us some support on revolut the link is in the description box also the link to the blogs of our esteemed guests andre larry and ray mcgovern who we hope will be joining us soon are also in the description box make sure to give them a like and check out their content because it really is worth looking into so, gentlemen, I'm going to start off today with the final uh, paragraph of an analysis I read yesterday on a substack by Big Surge. I don't know who Big Surge is, but sometimes he does put out some fairly good and deep thoughts about maybe too much tactical minutia. But yesterday he actually wrote a piece, or a few days ago, about the uh, Prigozhin thing, so to say. And I just want to start off on com our conversation by quoting his last paragraph. So... In the end, both the neoliberal commentariat and the Russian plan trusters are left with an unsatisfactory view of events. Prigozhin is neither the harbinger of regime change nor a piece in Putin's four-dimensional chess game. He's simply a mercurial and wildly irresponsible man who saw that his private military corporation was going to be taken away from him and decided to go to extreme and criminal lengths to prevent this. He was a card player with nothing in his hand who decided to bluff his way out of a corner until his bluff was called. So let's begin. Andre, was his bluff indeed called, i.e. Prigozhin's bluff on Saturday? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We spoke with Larry yesterday, and not only on the podcast, but in private, that uh, the whole story begins to line up extremely nicely. And uh, we are dealing here with indeed the guy who went completely bananas, So and his bluff was called. And I believe his bluff, as we concluded with Larry yesterday in our private conversation, that his bluff was expected, actually. So, and it was used, and we know the result. Uh, we have with us Ray McGovern. Uh, Ray, I don't know if you can hear us. Maybe you can try re-entering the studio once again. We see you, but we can't hear you, and we can't see you. Uh, maybe try using Google Chrome or try entering the studio once again, but we will be waiting here for you. Larry, uh, I know you've been uh, propounding an, a sort of alternative uh, version of what happened on Saturday. Um, and I'm looking through all the people that I trust and read on these accounts, for example, Scott Ritter, Colonel McGregor, you guys. Um, I think you've expanded on a very interesting theory, which would play well with uh, what otherwise being the propaganda tube of the CIA, the New York Times reported, that the Western intelligence agencies were expecting this. So in your estimation, yeah. if this indeed was uh, something to mislead the West, there has to be a sort of strategic goal that was aligned with this. Where do you think this is heading in terms of the next month or so? Well, I, I don't think it, the West was necessarily expecting it. I think the West was involved in fomenting it. So and what I mean by that, is that and andre may want to go into this at some uh, length later but uh the, the setting up of the wagner group was the wagner group was an element of russian intelligence from the standpoint of the gru and yet prigozhin became sort of the front man for it and it was a financial enterprise he was another government contractor uh i've drawn the parallel within the united states we got lockheed martin raytheon general dynamics uh, Prigozhin was just a little more colorful than those guys, but the same kind of corruption we see here in the United States. And uh, he got angry at some point with the Ministry of Defense. And I don't know how the process came about, but he wound up in North Africa and he wound up in conversation with members of Ukrainian intelligence, military intelligence, and I believe uh, British uh, MI6. And they basically pitched him because 
the West has is set dead set in this view that Putin's weak, Russia's weak, teetering on the brink of chaos, and that all the West has to do is just find that right person that will do what they want to do. And Prigozhin was willing to play along. I, I reject the concept that they were buying Prigozhin. The West doesn't have enough money to buy Prigozhin. Okay, yeah, this it, it, this was. This was his own personal animus and anger at the Minister of Defense, uh, Ministry of Defense. Uh, what? So if that had gone forward with just him without the Russians being aware of it, then, yeah, it could have been really damaging. But Russian counterintelligence picked up on it. And so from an intelligence standpoint, when you've got something like this unfolding, you got a choice to make. Do we blow it up right now or do we play it out? Find out who else is involved and maybe use it for our own end. I think that's what happened. That is why, because what puzzled me is in February and March and April, when Prigozhin was just saying the most insubordinate, outrageous things directed at the Ministry of Defense, uh, why he wasn't you know, pulled in and reined in. Uh, then we got the Tex uh, Jack Texera leaks, the airman right. that was uh, linked on Discord. And then within that was intelligence in, indicating that, in fact, this meeting with Prigozhin had taken place in Africa and that Prigozhin was providing the West with information about Russian troop locations. Now, to the average reader, they're reading, oh, boy, that man, that's bad. <laughs> this is, as I've written, this is the equivalent of taking Eskimos in January, a truckload of snow, because the United States and NATO already knew where the Russian positions were because they have this enormous ISR capability, the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. So, but again, from the Russian intelligence, you let it play out because this was building up Prigozhin's bona fides. It was building up Western confidence. Oh boy, this is our guy. And I firmly believe that his decision to launch this on the 23rd on Friday was because there was a plan in place that if he had succeeded, that NATO air support could have come to his aid because that marked the last day of this massive NATO exercise. But the Russians played it and played it brilliantly. They lined up troops in advance, the units were alerted, uh, and Prigozhin is, you know, he may be a, a good caterer, but he's a lousy military planner having no experience in that. Uh, absolutely didn't comprehend what it would take to move a force from Rostov on Don up to Moscow. You know, and I, I've, run, I've run through that in detail, and I think you've read it. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, you know, it's mission impossible. It's mission crazy. So uh, I know for a fact, and I t uh, Andre and I talked about this last night, U.S. military and in civilian intelligence is in complete chaos now in the United States. They can't figure out what's going on. They're like, what happened? We we thought this guy was, you know, so powerful and, and going to deliver for us. And it hasn't happened. What's, what's going on? They don't know. They honestly don't know. So uh, this is where, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if the Russians planned that, but by God, they got themselves an ancillary benefit. Uh, we do have... Ray with us. However, Ray, I don't think we can hear you. We can't see you. If you can hear us, <laughs> uh, maybe try playing around with the options uh, for the camera and for the mic and try entering the studio once again. We'd really love to have your input. Um, but if you're listening, that's also good. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Andre now. Andre, but it, it, if, okay, so Prigozhin goes to Belarus and there's been a lot of jokes going around that, you know, he shouldn't be standing in front of open windows right now. He should be really careful where he travels. And I'm getting the sense for the first time, because, you know, I, I was never the one who bought into the crap about Putin being a butcher, killing journalists and so on. But this is something the GRU, the FSB might want to look into a few years down the road, if you know what I mean. Um, what do you think? Uh, and I know you have contacts in Moscow and pretty high up contacts in, in, in the Russian military establishment, but without revealing too much detail or just giving your sense uh is putin long for i mean sorry is putin is, Pre <laughs> is is prigozhin long for this world because i'm getting the sense that a lot of people uh want to spill some blood over this um you need to look into the organization of wagner group 
which is essentially an, uh, for all intents and purposes, was an organized criminal group. Yeah. And Prigozhin was manipulated pretty well by the Council of the Commanders of the Wagner, which was filled, of course, with the professional military and uh, veterans of the all kinds of the uh, campaigns, uh, starting from Chechnya to Syria to what have you. And uh, the facts which begin to stream, and they are not the uh, anyway secret. For example, the former chief of the analytical department of the Wagner, he went on record the same as we, uh, we I know from, for example, there is no secret, uh, Marat Hairulin, uh, he is a top, uh, one of the best uh, Russia's um, military correspondents and reporters well connected with Russian military and the special military operation. They were basically torturing people, for example. If Prigozhin was absolutely, well, Mercurial is a kind of, uh, you know, easy term for him. He was absolute bananas. He was nuts. He loved uh, absolute power. He tortured people. If, for example, he tortured one of the guys who was in charge of the logistic, and they would send him photographs how much they beat the guy up, and he would say, no, you have to beat him more. And evidently, there were also some murders there. So, yeah, the question is, FSB and GR, GR, GU right now, GRU, they don't have to really look into this because there will be many people who would like to settle accounts with him, especially considering the fact, especially considering the fact that many people still uh, bypass and do not recognize this history of Bakhmut. That Bakhmut was not uh, absolutely what have been presented, be that in Russian or, or let alone Western media. And Western media are completely, I mean, detached from the realities of Russia and especially special military operation. Bakhmut was not supposed to happen. And uh, Prigozhin's, uh, uh, those idiotic rants uh, and absolutely unhinged, you know, uh, oh, here we have Ray. Hi, Ray. So Hi. And, the point is that uh, it was Prigozhin and his uh, 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 Council of Commanders who completely on their volition, in violation with the contract and operational uh, uh, orders, which gave them sector near Bakhmut to hold the line. They decided to show how good they are and basically ride the gravy train of the contracts, uh, contracts by demonstrating how dramatically good they are tactically and operationally. And essentially, they violated the orders and they went into Bakhmut. Hence, those unhinged uh, uh, you know, demands for the uh, ammunition and everything. And because of that, what happened, uh, Russian army had, uh, had to actually pull their reserves to cover their flanks, and then, of course, they were demanding more, more expenditure, more than daily combat load of yeah. their ammunition and everything. They, uh, they, so to speak, liberated Bakhmut at the price of up to 60, 50 percent of the casualties in their units. And very many in those units were actually precisely people from prisons. They, especially the hard, uh, hard criminals. And when uh, the uh, Minister of Defense forbade him to hire and to recruit uh, criminals from prisons, this is when he went completely bananas. And then, of course, uh, he understood as General uh, Lieutenant Lieutenant General Kartapolov today is yeah. on the record, the chair of the Security and Defense Committee of State Duma. He stated that today, officially on record, the guy went complete bananas when he understood that Minister of Defense will not extend his contracts. And that's when the whole thing went kaboom. Ray, uh, once again, welcome. <laughs> Glad to see you here. Um, so I want to allude to what Vladimir Putin said on Saturday morning because he compared the situation to uh, 1917 and he made it clear that no more 1917s in Russia. You, out of all of us, have, I think, the longest historical view and you've seen a lot of this thing from the inside. Uh, when, when I heard, that's a compliment, by the way. When, Ray, when I heard, Ray, when Ray, I, Ray was there in 1917. <laughs> said that. Larry said I that. Was, uh, I was undercover, actually. I was undercover. <laughs> I was undercover, yeah. Uh, he, he, he came with Lenin for, with that train to, uh, to, to Russia. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, in, in, in your view, uh, Ray, 
Was this an apt description, that comparison to 1917? Some are saying that it could have been compared to 1993 and the betrayal, what happened then with the storming of the parliament. What's your view on that historical comparison that Putin made uh, on Saturday morning? Well, I think it was very clever and very much a uh, hyperbole. Uh, I think the Russians quite quite aware of what uh, Prigo was uh, able to do. But, you know, most Russians have taken history and there are even some Russians around there, as old as I am, uh, who were not around in 1917, but know that history and know that 10 million, million, count them, million people were killed in that civil war between 17 and 21. That was big, you know. That was the, the major thing that the new authorities in Petersburg or Moscow had to contend with. So it was a really effective analogy. Do we want this kind of bloodletting? Of course we don't. Well, uh, there's not much likelihood, in my view, that Putin believed that that was in the cards. But uh, he wanted to be strong. He wanted to warn people what could be at stake. I mean, you can't rule it out. So I think it was a well-chosen metaphor, uh, but I don't think he faced that kind of uh, challenge from Trotsky or anybody else, it was Prigozhin, for God's sake. And you know, he shows what, what an inept person he was. I, I agree with uh, what's been said, and I thank my, my colleagues here for, for doing the, the real hard work and figuring out uh, what went down. Uh, Andre's uh, just explication of, of what he's learned. Uh, you know, I, I think the basic thing is pretty simple. Uh, Prigozhin learned that his contract was not going to be renewed. <laughs> losing all his, his truth. He losing everything. The MOD is not going to, Ministry of Defense is not going to replenish his supplies. Actually, they cut off his contracts <laughs> with the MOD. So, I mean, here's a, here's a desperate guy. What do I do? Well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do this. Now, I don't know. Uh, I don't have really good contacts. Most of the people that I know in the operations part of the CIA well, my Irish grandmother used to complain about her friends. Oh, they're all dead now. <laughs> like, you know, it's the damn fault. They're all dead now. Well, they are all dead now. I don't know the kinds of folks. I don't have the contacts that Larry has or that Andre has. But, my, you know, sometimes it's uh, the simplest explanation is the better I think uh, what Prigozhin faced it was enough to drive him still more bonkers, and more bananas, I guess is the word today. And that uh, if uh, some, you know, there's probably, I don't know how many people there are in, in Ukraine uh, connected Western, with Western services like the British or like even, even the CIA, but I would not rule out uh, uh, somebody telling uh, GS-12 at the station in Kiev, oh, oh wow, it uh, uh, looks like Prigozhin is going to make a move. Uh, what should I tell him? Cable back to headquarters. What's to lose? Yeah, tell him, go ahead. <laughs> My God, you know. Now, if, they, if, they're, that, if they're that stupid, if, if they're that ineffectual, well, that's one thing if they expected any success here. But the other thing is, Larry said, you know, if you don't want the primary uh, objective is to black at Putin and show he's not fully in control, or if they might have thought that that would happen. They are not all, they're not the sharpest knives in, in the drawer. So uh, my, my, basic, so my basic point here is that does this leave Putin stronger or weaker? Now, I read in the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, that he's much weaker now, that there are cleavages and dents and all that. You know, I don't believe any of this. <laughs> it's very, very clear to me. He emerges in an even more strong position that, indeed, there was a degree of embarrassment uh, that occurred and, you know, that Prigozhin uh, didn't get the the knife uh, is a little embarrassing, the more so, as Andre pointed out from the start, that 2022 uh, Russian airmen uh, probably did because of the shoot down yeah. those helicopters and that one other plane. So, yeah, there's a little bit of embarrassment there, but I think that effect is to make him really feel his oats. Uh, 
And uh, the proof is in the pudding. What happens next in, in uh, Ukraine, of course, will we'll determine a lot of this stuff. And my guess is that within the next three weeks, and I'd love to be challenged on this by people who know a hell of a lot more than I do, within the next three weeks, the, the Russians will be at the Dnieper, and they'll be saying, all right, are you ready to deal now? Uh, please challenge me on that. That may be far too uh, favorable to the Russian advance. <laughs> Well, uh, if anybody wants to see a good piece of comedy, which I think reflects on the analytical capabilities of and the sorry state of a lot of sectors of the U.S. intelligence community, I highly recommend Michael McFowl's tweets from Saturday. I mean, it's it's pure comedy. This is like this is like Saturday Night Live stuff material, and, and especially the last tweet. It was like. Mm. Damn, I wasn't expecting this. I was wrong at the end of the day. Just beautiful. At least, at least he had the temerity to say I was wrong. Whereas Ann Applebaum's article about civil war in Russia is still up on the Atlantic, I think. So there you go. I don't know. Maybe I have to write in Polish to Radek Sikorsky on Twitter to, to stop making himself an embarrassment. But uh, as for as for McFall, let me just ahead. say that uh, uh, he labeled his uh, his site without any apparent embarrassment. McFall's world. <laughs> That's Perfect. what it is. Perfect. I mean, the guy is, the guy, you talk about bonkers. Uh, this guy is bonkers in a very insidious way because I think he has the ear of Blinken and Nod and Sullivan and Nolan and all these. They actually believe what this guy says. He yeah. and, and some other misguided guys. So that's the problem. Um, let me just add this. I asked a psychiatrist friend of mine, you know, I'm worried. Do you think? President Biden is compass mentis. And the, the character wrote back, he says, doesn't matter. <laughs> what do you mean it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. When he was fully compass mentis, he listened to the same people who are running things now. So whether he's compass mentis or not, they're still in charge. They're running this stuff into the ground. Doesn't matter. Whoa. <laughs> Hello. It doesn't matter. Yep. Now, let me let me let me read. Uh, I, I received from a friend who's uh, directly, let's say, involved. He's got direct access to some of the intelligence going on, and it's not what well, I'm revealing. It's not classified. He's just giving right. the atmospherics, and he said that there. He says there's a ton of theories running wild right now, and uh, one thing seems abundantly clear: no one has a effing clue. This seriously threw our most qualified analysts for a loop. Even the most fork-tongued soothsayers have had to admit that peeling back the internal dynamics between Wagner, FSB, and the Kremlin is a best-guess situation at this point. So bottom line is, Intel community, they're in the same boat as McFall. Well, boy, we didn't expect that, and who saw this coming? And uh, it just it, it highlights sort of the lack of people of raised caliber back in the day where you had somebody with both the education and the language and the experience that could weigh in and try to bring some light. Um, exactly, exactly. Now Russia, as we all know, is losing in Iraq, which is probably the direct <laughs> uh, uh, consequence of the uh, Prigozhin's mutiny. So. Yeah. You know, what can, what can I say? I mean, you have to understand. You have to, Larry, you are absolutely, and Ray is absolutely on point. You know, uh, we have people who are utterly incompetent. They are just, I, I don't know how even to explain it. You know, uh, yesterday there was an article in the American Mind, I believe, there, this popular blog, and my friends on my discussion boards gave their. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, uh, link to it, and I will be using this uh, wonderful piece by one of the uh, Slavic scholars from San Francisco, and she writes that basically, I mean, we don't have any more the Russian and Slavic studies field. It was completely Ukrainized, and people believe this garbage, you know. So, and when you have people who believe this garbage, and especially against the background of Russia losing in Iraq. So there you go. What do you expect? You know, the, the times, yeah, I'm a cold warrior 1.0. And you say, oh, yeah, at that time, those people were just of a caliber. They knew their, you know, basically a craft. They knew what to do. And they had, a, you know, basically broad minds. And 
And now what do we have? We have people who believe that uh, Surabikin already is arrested. They have no clue how the command structure and, you know, how the uh, basically TOE of Russian armed forces, how it all operates. They have no idea how Russian political top operates. They bought into, yeah, Anna Palmbaum. She's not a historian. She's a shyster for crying out loud, you know. And that is why you cannot get those people on the uh, honest discussion because they are absolutely lost in this virtual world. And again, uh, what can I say? Looking at photos, uh, yeah, I just don't want to go there. You know, so it's... Let's go Brandon. Let's go Brandon. Um, okay, here, here, here's a thought, guys, because so... We know pretty much what happened on Saturday. We know the dynamics. We know who tried to use it most likely and who's surprised, who's living in McFall's world, as Ray said. But now he's he's in Belarus. Now, what I'm trying to figure out is if he's there to be managed by Lukashenko, if he's there to be taken apart by Lukashenko, or if he's there to be used by Lukashenko because Alexander Lukashenko did make a statement where he said, yeah, we can use some of the combat capabilities uh, of Wagner. That got a lot of people in Poland angry. They said, we're going to strengthen the border with Belarus, which is kind of hilarious because if you think about it, if Wagner actually went to fight against Poland, we'd probably have him in Warsaw in 24 hours. Anyway, uh, but uh, they're there. And the question is, what are they going to be doing there? Or what is Lukashenko going to be uh, doing with Wagner and with Prigozhin. So I'm going to throw that ball uh, first to uh, Larry. Uh, I don't know how many people have dogs. They take the dogs out for a walk and the squirrel shows up and the dogs go chasing the squirrel. Uh, Pri Prigozhin's the squirrel. He is now being used, I think, simply as an object of distraction and attention. Or he's like the shiny object that the magician holds up to get the audience focused on. Uh, because people in the West still believe, mistakenly, that he is actually this powerful military figure and he actually still carries some clout. And that the reason he's still alive means he must he must have naked pictures of Putin and Trump. Uh, you know, so, the, the, so it keeps everybody distracted and focused on what's going on in Belarus, which that may be, hey, uh, Let's, let's prepare for the possible operation from there. So I, I think that's what's going on with him. Uh, I think the Russians are, uh, you know, Putin and his generals and the Ministry of Defense, they're, they're going to make as much use of Prigozhin as possible, and he doesn't have a say in the matter if he wants to stay alive. Andre, your take? Uh, first, we need to uh, uh, keep in mind that the uh, disarmament of the whole Wagner group, which uh, de facto is done, it's over. There is no, right. there is not going to be going to be the Wagner. But disarmament from the, uh, you know, taking away those heavy weaponry. First, they, somehow they got Panzer air defense. That's what shut down K-50. Nobody knows how they got there. But there is, there's a lot to be said on how they were positioning themselves. There was a lot of arrogance on their part. And again, now I told you the story about Bakhmut. Actually, it goes even further back to 2018 and Deir Azor issue. This is when mm. the uh, Prigozhin sure. wanted to throw the guys over the line, uh, you know, the, which is the conflictual line. And uh, obviously, uh, Russian Defense Ministry and their staff and the Khmeini base said, you know, go there, do whatever you want. You know, you are kind of like commercial group. So they got themselves attached to this Syrian warlord and they wanted to go into the Kurds territory to do their money, you know, oil, all kinds of things. So American staff calls CENTCOM, I believe, calls Russians. And say, hey, are those your guys? And Russia said, no, they are not. Say, ah, okay. And they bombed the hell out of them, you know? <laughs> and guess what? Then, of course, Prigozhin panics. He flies to Moscow and talks to Shaigu and well, rather tries to grab Shaigu's sleeve. You have to understand their levels are very different. But he gets to Shaigu and Shaigu said, oh, you wanted to be a Napoleon. So how that worked out for you, you know? And so, and this is how it all started. They are not as good as they were portrayed. They are yeah. nobodies. If with their the, the typical private military company, TOE, Table of uh, Organization and Equipment, uh, they are basically lightly armed storm groups. 
there are nobodies without Russian army. Mm. And that's the whole thing. But evidently, they learned absolutely nothing from Syria. And Bakhmut was this thing. Now, Prigozhin, you know, as I already stated, there, are, there, there is a lot to be said. But he, as Larry correctly stated, he will be used as the, you know, shiny little thing, you know. And again, uh, the Wagner uh, by itself, how many people went uh, there in Belarus? Less than, I don't know, thousand maybe, maybe yeah. several hundred, most likely even less than that fewer than that and of course do not forget russia already has a full division actually group in belarus which it has in its <clears> possession <throat> all heavy equipment and now we know there are also tactical nuclear weapons there so appearance of precaution there who knows and belarusian kgb unlike fsb they are not really bound that well with the laws they can work in the good old ways if need be you know mm -hmm. so they can make him do what they want him to do and whatever will be his use but again wagner is done and just just to reinforce one thing that andre said before he jumped to ray um in at, at the headquarters the the joint air operations command center in Qatar. Uh, I know this firsthand from someone who was there. Every day, at least in 2018, there was a coordination phone call between the general and the Russian general staff. So that's where that's where it took place. And uh, so um, Andre's account about you know, Russians, uh, call, you know, the U.S. calling up saying, "Hey, what are you guys? What are your guys over there?" And the Russians, nope, not ours. <laughs> yeah, there you go. He lost uh, between 20 to, some people say, 80 Wagner people there. So there you go. Uh, Ray, would you, would you agree that, uh, because you, you, you've watched Soviet and Russian leadership up close for a long time, because the, the question that I have is, I'm, you know, Putin, I'm pretty sure knew of all this, all these shortcomings of Prigozhin, of Wagner, what they were doing, how they were being materially wanted to be these, you know, badass diehards out in the field. But would it reflect on the sort of naivete of Putin or the leadership in Moscow that they tolerated this situation for so long? Like I know that Andre in his post from Saturday mentioned one General Alexeyev, apparently, who was responsible for contracts in the MOD. Um, but Ray, from your perspective, and with obviously the benefit of hindsight, was it a mistake that Moscow tolerated Prigozhin and Wagner for so long? You know, I never could understand, and I don't understand now, why they tolerated his antics for so long. But I think the proof is in the pudding. They finally said, all right, we'll take away his weapons, we'll take away his people, we'll make sure his people have to sign up to the army. So, I mean, oh, all can just, just be patient for a while. Let's not have an un, unseemly dispute here. The guy is recognized as, uh, as bananas by so many people. Let's deal with them eventually. And it was all coming to a head. And as I say, that seems to be the cautious belly, so to speak. Why precaution? <laughs> yeah, do something and oh, why not? Why not take Rostov na Donu? You know, <laughs> hello. Right. So, and right now I'm feeling this open question. Anybody feel free to jump in. But okay, so right now we're, we're over the precaution thing, so to say. The situation is manageable, under control. The counteroffensive, everybody can see. I read an article in Forbes today. I think even Forbes mentioned that uh, for the Battle of Tokmak, it was like 25 tanks within a couple of minutes that were destroyed by the Russians. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that for the first time since the start of the SMO, we're seeing mainstream media being so honest in their assessments and so upfront with a lot of things that are happening on the, uh, on, on the southeastern front, which goes to show you that I think they're sort of preparing the audience to cope with what's to come. But... What do you think they might have up their sleeve if the counteroffensive is dying out, basically? The Prigozhin thing, as we call it, uh, is managed, destroyed within one day. Is there an option three for what else they might do? Or is it just going to be more coping, more coping? I'm throwing that question out there. Well, I'll, I'll jump in first. I yeah. think a lot of it hinges on what's at the upcoming NATO summit. Um, there is one growing division within NATO. Uh, whatever unity had existed prior to this about, you know, staying all in and throwing money and weapons at Ukraine, uh, there's now, I think, some serious second, second thoughts about that. Um, there is the group, though, within that whole NATO uh, gathering, the United States and UK, United Kingdom in particular, that are probably going to be pressing for expanding. You know, we'll go to 
Wunderwaffen level four, uh, cluster munitions, F-16s, um, M1 Abrams tanks that come in and, and save the day. But the problem they've got is the logistics on the ground because the army of Ukraine is being degraded now for the third time. Yeah. Uh, it's not like it's not the same army that existed at the start of the special military operation. And so as such, the, it's going to take a while to recreate, you know, recreate a fourth iteration. And, you know, I wrote, you know, sort of tongue in cheek about this, drawing the parallel with the Michael Keaton movie Multiplicity, where he kept having his body cloned so he, he could do more. But each succeeding generation of clone was less, was more dysfunctional, less competent until by the fourth generation, it was retarded. And I think that's exactly what's happening to the Ukrainian army. And so when they have less mental capability and more sophisticated weapons, that's a recipe for disaster right there. Jump in, guys. Go ahead. Um, if I may. Yep. Um, first, uh, let me put it this way. There are people in Pentagon, we know this for sure, who sit in those OPDs, operational departments, you know, and they are not idiots. They obviously went through some, you know, decent training in the, you know, U.S. Army War College. Some of those people went through their uh, command and general staff college in Leavenworth, Kansas. So not all of them are, you know, bananas and not all of them sore losers. They sit and calculate. They, they know how they can calculate their required force to accomplish, even from the open source, you already know approximately that basically, no matter what you throw in there, the machine is operating such on the Russian side that it doesn't matter. You cannot produce. Russia produces their number of smart munitions now more than whole NATO combined can possibly produce. And Russia produces more in one month than they will produce in a year. And it's just one of their kind of things. So do they want uh, uh, another embarrassment after all those NASAMs and Patriots being wiped out? Do they want to have 16s and Abrams? Russian attitude is very simple. Bring it on. And they know what's going to happen. They will be shut down. They will be destroyed on their airfields. So where do you fly them from? You fly them from Poland and Romania. But already Patrushev, already Putin, already a number of other uh, uh, high-level uh, people already stated, well, then, you know what? Their option is kind of self-evident. We're going to strike at where they're flying from, you know. So, and they know they cannot fly them into the airspace. They will be shut down immediately you, there's simply nothing like r37 in nato uh, arsenal and not going to be for a long time then when you look at this i'm not talking about russian air defense that's the whole other story so abrams sure send all abrams you know send in the clowns as the as the song goes you know so there you go and they know this so as larry stated you know what uh, i agree uh, it's probably going to be another wunderwaffe phase until they will have to, well, they will cope. They will continue to cope. Do they want more embarrassment? They will get more embarrassment. Uh, Ray, yeah, before you go now, I just want to segue in that before you uh, make your statement, just to consider, are they, uh, and I want to hear this from you, are they still considering the China option as a pressure element on the Russians? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thanks for asking that. If they are, it's even more forlorn hope than ever. In other words, the Chinese just made clear to Blinken, look, guys, <laughs> we and the Russians are joined at the hip. Don't mess around. Don't mess around getting involved directly with the Russians because we have a virtual alliance. So if there is any residual thought that they could drive a wedge between Russia and China, uh, they should wake up and smell the coffee, so to speak. It's exactly two years, almost exactly, June 16, 2021, when Putin met with, uh, with Biden in Geneva, the only face-to-face -face meeting. And Biden bragged about telling him, oh, we know you got this big problem, several thousand miles of border with a hostile China. 
uh, we know that that China and you know that China is uh, trying to beat the not only big military but also economic power in there. And we know that Biden's word, China is squeezing, squeezing you. So, huh? Just the opposite. And the next year and a half was spent by Putin and Xi trying to prove, trying to put daylight into people like Sullivan and Blinken. Now that you got 180 degrees wrong. So that's the, yeah, the, the alliance has never been stronger. <clears throat> and the Chinese are not acting very gently now when U.S. Uh, warships come w w very close to Taiwan. Uh, they're warning about this. And so they're, they, they're, they're sending uh, they're sending their own uh, uh, aircraft. What I wanted to say uh, with respect to what Larry and, and Andre have said, um, you know, some people have seen those photos. Larry had them on his blog. Was awful, awful photos of what war is really like. Um, at first, I was reluctant to look at them myself. But I, I have this idea that maybe Americans need to see that. You know, maybe the, the notion of fighting to the last Ukrainian is just kind of this intellectual concept. Maybe they need to see the photos of what we're doing to those little kids, the big kids. My God. And maybe, maybe some of the, uh, some of the rulers of NATO, if not the U.S., still have a human heart, like, you know, like I have one right here. And maybe a combination of a little bit of empathy with the notion, my God, we're going to throw more money after good money after bad. Maybe that will have a, maybe that will have some kind of effect in Vilnius. Do I think that it will? I think Larry's probably right. There's going to be one more, one more round of sending all these things. But, but let me just comment on how feckless our military leadership is. Now, I, I served for two years uh, back in the 60s. I was an infantry intelligence officer. And, you know, whether in the infantry as a platoon leader or in intelligence as an S2, I had to do an estimate of the situation. Sounds trite, doesn't it? But before, before I took my platoon into battle, much less an army, I had to, I had to measure enemy, how many there are how they're armed, where they are, who supports them, what kind of support in depth could they have? Whoa. So you have to sort of gauge the enemy. And then weather. Weather. Could weather play a role? Well, yeah, I suppose in Ukraine, <laughs> you can't move in the damn place for four months and out of the year. Okay. So that and then, um, oh, yeah, terrain, right? Terrain. <laughs> New York Times today has a front page story about, oh, we never took into account the terrain. And look, look at these pictures of the fortifications that the Russians have. And then all this blank space. And, and oh, my God, the terrain is really important all of a sudden, right? And what's the other thing? Locks, okay? Now, it's not, not the locks with the bagels that I used to eat in New York City. Lines of communication and supply, for God's sake. Look at the look at the map. See where Russia is. See where Ukraine is. See where the United States and the rest of NATO is. Okay, and uh, and get real. Okay, now um, on all those on all those fronts, uh, if people looked at that, they made exactly the wrong decision. It's almost as if they wanted to shoot NATO and the U.S. in the foot. Well, what, how could that be? Well, as uh, as Andre points out. They're reasonably educated people, at least at Leavenworth and maybe West Point. But, you know, they salute. And if General Austin, uh, former General Austin, the Secretary of Defense, and General Milley say, well, uh, hey, we got to keep doing this because the president wants us to do it, then they salute, okay? And there is no check on them. Now, intelligence analysts? What is, what is Lloyd Austin's general four-star experience with intelligence analysts? Well, he was commander of CENTCOM, right? With purview over the Middle East. 
this analyst said this is crazy or this is going nowhere uh, the uh, the us actually is encouraging this terrorism and it's not going to work and what did he do he changed all the, the the conclusions and he sent up to the white house what he thought the white house wanted to know which of course was true <laughs> and now look he, he's secretary of the press now what's the point never never in my experience have i seen 50 military analysts i mean active duty military risk their careers by making a formal complaint to the inspector general of the pentagon okay what happened well you know what usually happens a two star was named to to examine a, to investigate a four star <laughs> you know what's going to happen with that so he was let off the hook but that's the guy he's the same guy the worst thing and maybe this is something people don't know is that the cia used to have a military division professionals who knew something about what i've just been discussing okay they could put a break on what the pentagon was saying in my day on vietnam we told we tried to tell the president look don't believe westmoreland for god's sake he says there can be only 299,000 enemy armed in the in the south that, that's wrong it's twice that mr president now did we get the first base no but that was politicization at the very top of the cia and the government my point is simply this that there's no left there's no remaining even residual break on what milley and what austin want to tell the president or what uh, sullivan tells them to tell the president so it's really corrupted to the point where it's almost better i won't say almost better it's better not to have a cia if they can't really make some sort of contribution to attenuate this foolishness they should be disbanded and there should be a separate analytical institution set up as independent as one can be and then if they want the operations they want to blow a pipeline well put that under the pentagon for god's sake where it belongs and make it real secret but but don't don't let it color the analysis don't let it uh, bl blow up pipelines that the analysts if they had their salt would have said what well, you could you know what's gonna happen the next day you know what's gonna happen in germany maybe not right away but in two years or three so uh it, the the thing is a shambles uh it's very sad for me to say this because a long time you know i resisted the notion that the cia should be abolished because i didn't want the the baby to be flushed out with the bathwater. Uh, there were there was a baby. There was one baby in 2007, which prevented Bush and Cheney from making war on Iran. That's provable, and uh, Bush complained about it in his memoir. Uh, this estimate uh, that uh, Iran was not working on a nuclear weapon gave me no option for military strike because how could I attack a country that the intelligence community says has no active nuclear weapons program bummer those are words from his book so there used to be a function for uh, for courageous analysts who would tell the truth and have a superior in this case uh, what was his name again tom finger he, he came from state department intelligence but he had guts and so he prevented a war so that's you know for those that was 2007 what is it now you do the math now there's no baby anymore Flush it all down, down the drain. Well, even for uh, George W. Bush, we talked about funny moments. I remember one of his funnier moments where at a press conference he asked, what's the French word for entrepreneur? That was just, <laughs> that, that, that was fantastic. Um, we we God, have a, we God have an, the queen. <laughs> God save the queen and the war in Iraq. Um, I'm going to put up a question from one of our viewers for you gents to look at. Uh, Bluter is asking, will Russia make an advance after this or continue the slow grind? Anybody want to jump in on that question? Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think they're going to, I think they're going to step up their advance. The, the slow grind is coming to an end. You know, part of it, as Wayne noted, it, it has to do with weather. Time's running out. You know, they're, they're going to be, we're in the middle of, close to the middle of July now. Uh, you get August, September, and then all of a sudden you're into the October rains and the terrain becomes very difficult to, to drive through. So that's why I say I don't see Ukraine having any ability to 
resupply or um, bring in new troops that are trained, properly trained and can operate, particularly at the command level. Uh, that's where I think Russia has stepped up its attacks on decision making centers as part to a trip. The number of decision makers that are competent that could work that have some knowledge about how to maneuver uh, battalions and brigades. So I, I think we're we're, into, we're on the on the verge of entering a new phase of the war because I don't see Russia wanting to keep the dragging this out for as long as possible. That's what the West wants, and I don't see Russia pandering to Western desires. I think but, Vilnius uh, summit kind of uh, separation uh, line here. After that, the general staff will be making decisions on what to do. But yeah, there are all indications that uh, they will be stepping up of the operations. And we have to uh, we have to remember that this is what is not being reported. And this is another thing. Russia sitting in the strategic defense doesn't mean that you do not do offensive operations. Remember uh, almost... Uh, Eight months ago, when Russians, you know, left Kupiansk and all, the, well, guess where Russians are? A few kilometers from Kupiansk, back again. So there is a lot of offensive action going on, but of course there is no yet this uh, big arrow uh, offenses because the game is obviously predicated, so to speak, on what Mr. Putin, Mr. Shaigu, Mr. Lavrov have uh, on their tables during the morning briefing intelligence briefing and we do not know that and i say all the time i wish i was the fly on the you know on the wall at least for 20 minutes you know when but the point is obviously they play not just military part they play the foreign uh, foreign uh, relations part they play economic part and you know it is all combination so to speak which translates itself into the coherent national policy which has to be developed, you know, in, in order to basically both defeat the combined West, which already actually has been defeated. It's just a matter of the arranging how things will go after that. And, of course, keeping their lead on the escalation towards nuclear uh, um, threshold. We have to remember this. We have in Washington especially in the State Department people who are nuts. I mean, they are fanatics this is neocon cabal. They effectively uh, hold the U.S. foreign relations policies hostage. And we don't know how many people which are also bananas who are ready to do some unthinkable things. And I'm pretty sure that Mr. Putin, Putin every morning and includes the members of the Security Council, they know what is going on, not just on the front but also around the world, and especially where it really matters, Washington. There are only three poles of power right now in the world. It's Washington, Beijing, and Moscow. The rest doesn't matter that much. It's really kind of, you know, on the different level. And how these three will arrange things, you know, even Russians say, yeah, we eventually will have to talk to the United States, but Russians are not interested in talking to Ukraine or Europeans or whoever else. And Beijing is sitting there waiting and looking at this. And yeah, I know the a Chinese attitude towards all that from people who are sinologists. So, and I would say that, yeah, we might see the real activization of the offensive operations. So, but Vilnius probably is the kind of, you know, the point where we have to look at it, you know, more intensively. Ray, you were around in Operation Barbarossa, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough slog, I'll tell you. <laughs> I was between one and five years old. Yeah. I was around for all of World War II, so I'll get, give you that. Um, I have a couple of points to make, but the first I want to ask the experts uh, on today and Larry, uh, one factor that hasn't been mentioned, I mean, weather has been mentioned, thanks for reminding us, Larry, the election. Uh, now, Putin has shown himself extremely sensitive to the fact that American foreign policy is really just a creature of politics in the United States. He said that explicitly. 
And that accounts for various uh, duplicity and various uh, backdowning on, on things like uh, ceasefires in Syria and other stuff like that. So here's, here's Biden uh, <laughs> saying, God save the queen and, and talking about Iraq instead of Ukraine. Um, and yet he's running for president, my God. Yeah. And now I can't figure out, or, you know, this is really hard. Maybe nobody can really have a definitive view on this, but how does this enter uh, those calculations that in the races are every morning at the National Security Council in Moscow, okay? I mean, do they say, look, we're doing this slog, this tough attrition warfare we have all the artillery we need we just get, need to keep up we're doing and yeah it's gonna take till next year to do but next year uh, the campaign will be in full swing and maybe the americans will vote for some person like bobby kennedy or something like that just complete is it is is that gonna be the way to come at it or are they gonna come out and say look as we're not gonna be able to move in just two or three months let's get this <laughs> Let's get this damn thing done now. What do you think, Andre and Larry? Larry, go right ahead. Okay. Um, the first dynamic that I think is going to be at play, um, Biden's coming under increasing pressure over the emerging evidence about bribery and corruption. Uh, the mainstream media that used to ignore this are now covering it. So mm -hmm. CBS 60 Minutes, for example, that coupled with the whistleblowers that are coming forth, I think he's going to be more polit politically besieged. And as that pressure increases, his mental faculties are going to continue to accelerate and, and, and diminish. Uh, the Democrats are going to be desperately looking for some sort of uh, exit pattern. The problem is in the United States is that on the Republican side, they're as crazy as the Democrats in terms of uh, wanting to uh, expand this conflict. With Lindsey Graham and Dick Blumenthal, the Democrat, you know, Blumenthal's a Democrat, then and and, and a Vietnam Trump. veteran, and a Vietnam yeah. veteran, yeah, <laughs> Vietnam, yeah, you know, he was there, De, you know, De, De Nang Dick, they called him, um, for claiming he was in a war that he never was in. Um, that you know, they're talking about wanting to enact Article Five and bring NATO right into the fight right away, so you know. The, I, I experienced something years ago when I was at the teaching a senior crisis management seminar. Every month we would have a different government, and I did it for countries for countries out of Latin America, Central and South Africa, Asia, Middle East, uh, across the globe. And I found one common thing, and this was during the the war in in Iraq in 2004 2005. All of these foreigners didn't matter what their religious background, what their cultural background, what their language, all of them believed that the United States had some secret plan we weren't telling them about, that we really couldn't be this stupid and this incompetent. <laughs> I mean, honest to God. And, and, and I had to say, guys, sorry to burst your bubble here, but yeah, we are actually that bad. And they were like, how can that be? And I think that's part of what Russia is grappling with right now, in answer to Ray's question. Exactly. Uh, well, uh, one of the, I always say uh, when people in Russia, you know, ask me, why your books haven't been uh, published in Russia? They should be, you know, they're published in Polish, they're published in <laughs> South Korean, you know, in German and all that. I said, uh, if my books will be published in Russian, most of the uh, Russian establishment Americanists should be fired because they have no clue what they're dealing with. So, but luckily, Mr. Putin and Kremlin do not communicate with them. They communicate with Russian diplomacy, SVR, the service of the external or foreign intelligence, FSB, and other competent people. But academically, I mean, uh, my books are basically are what you said. There is no secret plan. It was in the open all the time. And when yeah. you begin to run numbers, you know, operational issues, it's like, oh my God, you know, just, and uh, and yeah, Russians being paranoid, justly so, about the whole thing outside, absolutely, uh, justifiably. Then when you look and say, uh, oh, let's not 
uh, underestimate the enemy. I said, yeah, let's not. It's good. But let's not overestimate it too because it becomes even the actual sin onto its own. Because you need to be a realist, you need to understand what goes into, so to speak, this machine to, and what you get uh, as the output. And uh, when you look at this, like, oh my God, how you deal with the United States right now, who you going to talk to? That's the main problem. You know, you probably can talk even in France, although I think so France is done, you can theoretically talk to Marine Le Pen, okay? You can talk to some politicians, let's say, even in Germany, you know? But who do you talk to in the United States? Yeah. And uh, that's the point mm-hmm. which Putin is on the record, Lavrov is on the record, he said, uh, we're going to talk when you guys are ready. Mm-hmm. So they understand the internal dynamics in the United States. But I can t- just add one thing, which is the funniest thing at all. One of the results of the uh, uh, Prigozhin affair that was Putin approval rating went from 80% to 90 So <laughs> that pretty much tells you everything you need to know. And these are mm-hmm. by independent poll. poll. Yeah. So, well, let, let me just, if I may, go ahead. Uh, of course, Mike. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I know this is really a hard question, and I didn't ask it right, but let me try again. Uh, given the Kremlin's appraisal of political dynamics in the United States, are they more likely to go ahead before the rains come and the mud comes and finish off this thing, or? Are they more likely to just a trit and a trit and a trit and carry this thing into next year? Uh, that's a tough. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> that's yeah, why it's I asked a the tough question. question. Yeah, because what do you think? we, for the first time you know, since Vietnam, United States, not most population do not doesn't understand it. But for the first time since Vietnam. U.S. foreign policy is being driven by the events in some other place, which is, of course, Ukraine, more than Iraq, more than Afghanistan. And because there's so much at stake for the combined West there. So and this is this interplay. Will Russia go and finish it off? Absolutely possible. How yeah. probable it is, as I already stated, that watershed moment should be after seeing what's going to be decided in the summit in Vilnius. Years, see yeah. what will be uh, de- mm-hmm. delivered, so to speak, then how m- much time it will take to wipe out all this help, which will be wiped out with the, again, horrendous losses to whatever is going to be thrown, you know, impaled, basically, and then mm-hmm. see if we'll go from there. But who knows? Russia may do this, you know, trick of the tail and do just prior to Vilnius summit, go on to something really big, you know, and that's pretty much going to close the agenda and say, yeah, you know what, screw that. And Mm -hmm. as Larry correctly stated that, yeah, we have now the mainstream media speaking about things. I Mm -hmm. saw today Forbes, they say, oh, my God, the losses are catastrophic, you know. Well, well, sure, Mm -hmm. didn't we tell you this for the last year? You know, so there you go. Yeah, where where were you last summer? Um, I have, I have a question Mike, about Mike. Yeah. Mike, could I just uh, I have just a couple of real small things here? Sure, go ahead. Uh, one is that I want to express appreciation if I haven't already done for all the very, really tough work that uh, Larry and, and Andre have done. I want to apologize for being late. I couldn't find the link. And then I couldn't get on through Firefox. I had to go back to Chrome and all that stuff. So I, I sincerely apologize. It's uh, no not problem. very polite no, to be no late. Problem. Yeah. But thirdly, and more important, uh, nobody has mentioned the uh, nuclear power plant at Zaporozhye. Yeah. yeah now, that's I'd, like to, I'd like to see, I mean, just to set the stage here, June 20th, Budanov of surface. He said, the most terrifying thing is that the Russians are going to attack their the power plant, okay? On the 22nd, Zelensky says the same thing. This is going to be awful, okay? And it's the Russians. And they'll blame it on us, probably, the Russians will, you know, okay? Next day, June 23rd, Lindsey Graham, resolution in Congress. If you blow up the nuclear power plant, that can be, that can be considered an attack on NATO and will invoke article five 
what the hell is going on there? I mean, do if if the Ukrainians feel that they their back is really against the wall, and that the uh, Vilnius is not going to help them, uh, what's to prevent them from blowing up at least one of those uh, cooling ponds at Zaporozhye? What do you guys think? They yeah, have no, been I, trying. Yeah, Larry, go, go right ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to say I think they're. Um, I don't think they don't have the military. Ukraine no longer has the military capability to carry that out. I mean, so they hit it with some high Mars. Uh, Russia has not got the plant up and running full blast so that if one of the uh, reactors is breached, you're going to have a major disaster. It's basically shut down and it's uh, and, and and the Russians have it fortified and, and pretty well defended. Uh, but this again, this is. Uh, another indicator or symptomatic of the craziness of the West and the desperation because that's desperation. If, yeah. Yeah. If they were, things were going well for them, uh, they, they wouldn't even entertain this. They'd be, they'd be marching to the sea of Azov. You know, they would be breaching the third line of uh, Russian military defense. Hell, they haven't even reached the first line and, yeah. and they've depleted their force. I, I guess the numbers now, Close to fifty percent of their manpower and equipment's been used up, and they and they've got nothing to show for it. So, mm -hmm. but but you're right, Ray, that the they would like to try to create the predicate of a nuclear threat and again. And this goes back to uh, Graham and Blumenthal to justify enacting Article Five because mm -hmm. getting NATO involved militarily directly with soldiers and uh, on the ground. It, the, Ukraine now understands that's their only possible chance of surviving this. And and even if that happens, they won't survive it. In well, that, actually, yeah, they were go, throwing go ahead, those diversionary uh, uh, recon groups trying to penetrate their um, uh, um, basically premises of the Zaporozhye nuclear plant. All of them have been annihilated. And yeah, there is a serious air defense um, there. So plus the reactors themselves are fairly well, uh, you know, enclosed. So it's not an easy thing. You need a lot of power and firepower to really breach that. So will they the go calling... that? Certainly possible. But again, there is a counter, mm -hmm. there is a defense there too. Well, if they hit just one of the cooling ponds, you know, yeah, I'm told by people who know about such things that could be a real disaster and change. Oh yeah, the that whole could be. Yeah, thing. absolutely. But yeah. I think so. They still have a long way to go to really do anything which will be so dangerous that somebody can start screaming. Plus, again, whatever the Congress decides at this stage, it's only a recommendational thing. They cannot That's actually right. enforce it. It is still the prerogative of the executive power. Right. So right. Lindsey mm -hmm. Graham is just being the jerk that he is. You know, so he, he's doing the Lindsey Graham thing. People of South, South Carolina really have to take a really, uh, you know, serious look in the mirror how this... Uh, a hole, pardon my French, has been elected consistently. The guy is absolutely deranged, and you know. So what? What can I say? You know. And since we're talking nuclear, uh, gentlemen, uh, I want to ask because a lot of people have been uh, reflecting. their sort of concern with, and I know I'm going to raise Andre's blood pressure now by mentioning Sergei Karaganov and his famous article oh, on God. on potential <laughs> nuclear first strikes. But but this is personal for. Uh, Ray and me, because for Ray, because he's Irish, and Karaganov mentioned hitting Boston possibly, and me, because he mentioned Poznan, where my in-laws live nearby. Now, a lot of people in the States would say, hey, your in-laws live near, near Poznan, you should support nuking Poznan in that regard. But I love my in-laws, so my question <laughs> is, uh, and to all of you, uh, Karaganov, how seriously should we take his words? Did they have the blessing of the Kremlin or was it just his fantasy in the famous article from a few weeks back that Russia might consider a potential preemptive preemptive nuclear strike to scare the West off from even thinking about nuking Russia? Go ahead. The guy is a complete shyster and idiot. And he doesn't reflect any position of Kremlin because his article came out weak before Mr. and then was issued by the major uh, um, news outlet such as RIA the same day when Mr. Lavrov was 
on record speaking, and it is on the side of the Russian foreign ministry, that no, Russia is not going to use any nukes. Russian nuclear doctrine is specifically designed in such a way as to give a clear understanding of the criteria of the use of the nuclear weapons. And Karagana has zero background in any military or let alone technological issues related to the use of the nuclear weapons. The guy is a shyster. And this is also one of those. This is Prigozhin redux. There are many uh, media and so-called uh, old, you know, nomenclature children like uh, Mr. Karaganov, who didn't ha- have uh, didn't work a day in the serious work in his life because he was from their very privileged family in Moscow. These are the people with soft degrees who never worked a day and they pretend that they understand modern geopolitics and modern warfare. And they need to keep people with other media prostitutes, as they are correctly stated, could keep, uh, you know, reminding about themselves. Plus, the guy runs a department in the high school of economics. It's the uh, basically a cesspool of those liberals, pro-Western, you know, fifth uh, columnists. So what do you expect? But again, you have to understand, Russian media are not much better than American ones. That is why, for example, I refer to them when only I don't have to They report straight news, straight statements or straight news. The rest of it, it's a bunch of nobodies who want to stay relevant. And the special military operation and what it ignited, it completely cut out the whole portion of the so-called expert class in Russia who have no clue what they're talking about. They're simply not professionally adequate for that. And Karaganov is precisely the type of the narcissistic nobody. He has no clue about anything he writes about. So yeah, that's, a great, that's a great term. I'll steal that. Narcissistic nobody. What Andre said, I agree. Well, Andre, I, I wish you would speak your mind here and not hold back. About it. <laughs> <laughs> Did he steal your girlfriend at some point? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, he won't. Oh, no. Okay. No, I, I, think- I, I I agree. I mean, what a wonderful blessing that Andre knows these guys, you know? I mean, hold on, where else do you get this? It's certainly not on Fox News or the so-called mainstream media. So, and thanks for getting up so early, uh, Andre. This is, uh, you know, yeah, for, well, no, it's fine. It's fine. For it's us, we've worried. had breakfast it's already. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think I'm going to be inviting everybody to a podcast, a cage match here. I'm going to get Andre and in one corner and Karaganov in one corner, and the rest of us are just going to be eating popcorn. And I want to see this. I want to oh, see this. Uh, Andre, versus the, Andre, versus, Andre versus the shyster. It's going to be a great battle. You know, I love the title itself. Uh, gentlemen, you've been very gracious for your time, so I'm going to be uh, moving to our final question uh, because I did see a headline yesterday whereby Benjamin Netanyahu is apparently considering visiting Kiev. Now, we know that Israel in the last couple of months has been having its own turmoil. The documents that were uh, uncovered by one Jack Teixeira apparently point to even the Mossad turning against Bibi. Apparently, they've even had enough which in many ways seems to put my sympathies a little bit on BB's side because if you have the Mossad and George Soros going against you, it's like, ah, he must be doing something right. But as I said, that's very subjective (laughs) on my part. But apparently uh, he made a statement, I think it was yesterday or the other day, that there will be, I'm not quoting directly right here, but there will be a reevaluation of Israel's stance vis-a-vis Russia. Now, this is either going to be something big or this is just for propaganda purposes to calm down uh, Netanyahu's opposition. But I do want to get all three of your uh, thoughts on a possible realignment of Israel vis-a-vis Russia, or are we going to see more of the same? And I'll start off with uh, Ray, if I may. It's hard to decipher what the Israelis have in mind. What they're doing now is they've just authorized several tens of thousands of new settlements in Palestine. Uh, Talk about going bananas. There's no break on that. Uh, The U.S. will probably acquiesce. Uh, They need to get the other people to acquiesce in that. So my best guess, and it's only a guess, is they're putting out feelers. So what, what do you think there, uh, Russia? Do you think uh, you understand what it is to have insurgents and all, all these uh, 
Palestinians. So uh, this is what we're going to do, uh, just to feel out what the Russian reaction would be, because uh, Russian reactions are important still. But that's just a guess on my part. Uh, Andre and Larry probably have a better idea. Uh, it's, uh, your, uh, my guess is good as yours. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, how to put it, uh, Israel has now this needle up its, uh, you know, uh, below the lower back, which is, of course, Khmeimim base and Tartus. And Russia's military presence basically changes the whole dynamics in the region. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Israel is not very happy about that. But I'm pretty sure there's a lot of PR about this, you know, there. Mm -hmm. I think so. It's mostly PR because mm -hmm. in many respects, especially against the background of United States abdicating either on own volition or, you know, somehow uh, from its own self-proclaimed hegemony, hegemony, who's going to take care of Israel? Mm -hmm. Who are they going to run to? Well, I mean, Russia is one of the options because at least Russians can hold back Iran, you know, mm -hmm. at least kind of manage this whole situation. Mm -hmm. And Iran is developing. And now that Iran has this whole new role in uh, basically BRICS, essentially, which is coming, he's joining. And of course, in the, the de facto regional alliance between Russia and Iran, my God, Iran is going to get a lot of good weapons. And mm -hmm. Israel is nervous, very nervous. Mm -hmm. so, there you go. But yep. you got the, the, the Israeli arrogance, which is they're, they're notorious for it, uh, is still also part of, I, I view Israel, they're, they're like Russia's version of Florida. You know, <laughs> all, all, the, all the Jewish members, all the Jewish snowbirds, you know, flock to Israel to escape the winter. And, the, and there's a significant uh, Russian and even Ukrainian presence there. Uh, I, I've, no, I've noted that uh, this one guy who's counted by the United States as the ultimate Russian criminal guy, Simeon Mogilevich, is actually a Ukrainian, but he's got he's an Israeli citizen, carries a passport, and you know they don't arrest him. So my point is, Israel's very pragmatic about being self-interested. They've always counted on the United States to back him, but I think they can recognize that there's a sea change underway in the Middle East because between China and Russia, they're altering the landscape. So I don't see Netanyahu taking steps to irritate or isolate uh, uh, either Russia or China. I think they're going to be moving to try to figure out how to cultivate closer ties because, as Andre noted, keeping Iran under control is something they want to do. In the past, prior, you know, when Trump was around, there was that element in DOD that, like Milley, pushing to start a war with Iran. And at that time, they could count on Saudi Arabia, perhaps, to allow mm -hmm. air refueling to take place for an airstrike uh, in Iran. They don't have that now. Israel has no ability to launch any kind of air operation against Iran. They don't have anything where they can overfly to refuel. And the United States is not in a position to back that. So the threat of that has receded, I believe. But uh, they're going to be watching carefully what, uh, what happens on the broader geopolitical uh, space. Because I'm, I'm, I'm getting some uh, uh, red flags going up with regards to the United States looking to provoke China. And we could fi suddenly find ourselves no longer worried about Ukraine and Russia. But uh, the United States would be in a shooting war with China. So... Uh, all of that, I think, is context that Israel's going to do whatever it needs to save itself, and they're not going to tie themselves to the United States if it's a millstone. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of orphan. Well, APAC won't have anything to do anymore, or they will, but they'll be relegated to like, you know, pipsqueak status, which is a good thing, obviously. Everyone yeah. supports that, I think. Um, but yes, the changes are a coming and they are they are massive. And I hope to discuss them once again soon, because I think the dynamics are such that we might be having another panel like this within a few weeks time. Uh, gentlemen, thank you once again on behalf of Voting TV and our audience who numbered almost 700 today, which we had a record, which is great, which just shows that information is power and we need more such discussions. I want to thank our guest, Ray McGovern, 
out there in Washington, Andre in the in the Seattle bushes, so to say, and Larry Johnson down from the great and beautiful state of Florida. And I'm Mike Krupa based in Poland, sending you our best. Make sure to give us a subscribe, a like. Remember to support our work on Revolut. We are thinking about starting a new studio here on my village, which, by the way, as you guys were speaking, there's a great Antonov 2 that just flew over my house, <laughs> dropping anti-mosquito repellent. I don't know if you heard it, but it was a big one. Came down pretty low, so we had to close down all our windows. AN2, what a great plane. Um, once again, uh, in the description box, you'll find the blogs of Andre, Larry, and Ray, also his Twitter. Make sure to give them a like and a follow, and I thank everyone for joining us today. God bless you all. Have a great day, evening, and morning. Take care. Ray, we we go. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Ray, you owe us and Larry appearance on our friend Palit Vieira. Our audience is just begging for you to appear <laughs> on the podcast. I will be translating. Please do, yeah. Okay, I'll tell Vera that yeah. we three, it's going to be a huge hit, okay? Larry is already very popular in Russia. You have the documentary about you, Ray, on the first channel, which was running, if you don't know. So, yeah, okay, I'm telling my friend that we are going online. Terrific. Very soon. More Please good send news me a link then. to that. Please send me a link to that oh, documentary. Oh, absolutely. Vera will be ecstatic. All right. Thank you guys Thank once you again. Very much.